from WBUR Boston and NPR. I'm Jane Clayson. This is On Point. Since Prozac came onto the scene in the late 1980s, we've become a nation obsessed with pills as a cure-all. Low-cost, quick-fix solutions have co-opted our mental health care system, leaving people without the help they need, even though rates of anxiety, depression, and suicide are on the rise. With my guest today, we'll hear his call to save the one thing he says really works, traditional talk therapy. This hour on point, can we talk? You can join us on air or online. What kind of therapy have you found helpful? Have you shopped around? Tell us your experience. Join us anytime at onpointradio.org or on Twitter and Facebook at On Point Radio. Joining me this hour from Studio City, California, is Enrico Naulotti. He's a clinical psychologist and author of the new book, Saving Talk Therapy, How Health Insurers, Big Pharma, and Slanted Science Are Ruining Good Mental Health Care. Enrico Naulotti, welcome uh, to the program. Nice to have you. Thanks for having me on the show, Jen. Well, it's been interesting um, to learn how you came to be a, a therapist. Briefly walk us through the highlights of how you got to where you are today. Oh, my goodness. I didn't expect that question. I'm going, I'm going to have to get personal <laughs> yeah. right, right out of the gate. You're the psychologist. No, I, yeah, I mean, I was a sort of a working class kid, believe it or not, G- grew up in Glasgow, Scotland, you know, uh, studied for the Catholic priesthood in mm-hmm. my teenage years, mm-hmm. um, came to the United States as an immigrant and uh, in college essentially had an emotional breakdown, which thankfully in those days, the zeitgeist being what it was, I, uh, you know, thought of it as more of an identity crisis. And I got into psychotherapy myself, which would be, have be unheard of, you know, in the kind of family that I grew up in. And I found it immensely beneficial. And that in combination with, you know, the easy accessibility of wonderful books that that uh, were more psychoanalytically oriented, you know, old classics like Eric Fromm's Escape from Freedom, uh, uh, e- e- you know, in the 80s, you know, The Drama of the Gifted Child, mm-hmm. books like mm-hmm. that just really f- were instrumental and just really kind of enlightening me and making me want to... Uh, uh, so the same sort of energy that I, as a young uh, teenager, made me think I had a vocation of the priesthood, you know, sort of made me think that I had a, this other vocation to, to become mm. a psychotherapist. Mm. And so your your book, uh, Fast Forward, uh, implores us to save talk therapy. I, I'm just curious, with this background that you have and with this perspective and position that you're taking, tell us what a typical day with clients looks like for you today. Uh, these Well, for me, I think it's very different than, than maybe the, the typical therapist. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I'm mm-hmm. comfortably ensconced you know, in the kind of practice where uh, I see clients for, for you know, long periods of time uh, who stick around and who mostly benefit. Uh, so, you know, I, I these days I'm in my late 50s. I, you know, I'm, s- some of the therapists listening in are going to uh, uh, um, might find this surprising. But when I was younger, I it was not uncommon for me to see maybe 40, 45 clients in a week. The, these days I see, you know, roughly about 35 clients a week. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, wh- 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 my days are long and arduous. Mm-hmm. And, and you write that the enterprise of seeing a shrink has shrunk. <laughs> uh, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, you know, when I first started out, you know, there was this quasi-spiritual, kind of culturally sanctioned quasi-spiritual experience, uh, endeavor of what we used to call entering therapy. You know, and, and what was meant by that back in the day, I think, is that really therapy is a place and a space to settle in at your own pace and in your own kind of meandering way tell your troubled life story do an honest inventory of your life, almost take a vow of honesty. And I think that's what Freud meant by free association. You take a vow of honesty, you think the unthinkable, feel the unfeelable, say the unsayable without the usual social consequences. 
you engage in that very delicate and unnerving process of accessing and articulating difficult emotions. And so it meant something. It was sort of life-altering. These days, you know, it's the average client is more likely to what I call receive mental health interventions rather than go into therapy. What does that mean, mental health interventions? Well, I mean, with the, the dominance of cognitive behavioral therapy, you know, it's, it's, it's really a focus on correcting thinking errors and changing bad, bad habits. You know, it's a very, very agenda-driven approach. You know, I, I, I kind of – yesterday I went online and uh, looked at a training vi- video of cognitive behavioral therapy because I wanted to, you know, remind myself of – at an experiential level of, of what that was like. And I, I – not to badmouth anyone, but, you know, I came across a, a – well, actually, I won't name names, but a, a leading – cognitive behavioral mm-hmm, therapist, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. W- watched the, her entire session with a client and I was uh, struck at, at, at a number of very basic levels about how much talking the therapist did rather than listening. Mm. And this is the, pr- well, the, uh, among other things, this is one of the problems with cognitive behavioral therapists. I think there's just, in the room, the therapist is trying to be too productive, too efficient, too busy, too explanatory too informational, really not giving clients enough space and time to really access emotion, which is a very, very delicate process that most clients will only tap into and and, uh, uh, if there's that confident Mm -hmm. expectation Mm -hmm. of empathy that the therapist will be there and inscribed on their face, show a level of receptivity that will make them open up and talk. So I want to talk more about CBT uh, in a minute and draw you out on that point. But but part of the, the thesis of your book is, is not just that. It's about how health insurers and big pharma and slanted science are, are ruining good, good mental health. Um, how so? Boy, I really sort of break it down in the book, but uh, let, 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 let's start with um, big pharma. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you if you look at surveys, about anywhere between seventy five to ninety percent of people entering the you know look, looking for mental health services would prefer to talk to a professional about their problems, yet. That gets flipped in the delivery of care. So about 58% end up taking meds alone without any kind of therapy. So, so how did talk it, therapy it, take a backseat then to, to, to the biomedical revolution, if you will? You can really trace it back to the advent of Prozac. The, Prozac was marketed back in the late 80s as a very safe drug, a very effective drug, compared to the previous generation of antidepressants, whereby, and it was marketed to primary care physicians, and that, that might be perhaps the single most uh, uh, important reason for the decline of talk therapy, the marketing of Prozac to primary care physicians. At one time, primary care physicians, when a client broke down and started sobbing their office, sobbing about you know, a troubled marriage or a tyrannical boss, they would get a referral to, to, to a psychotherapist. There's been a 50% decline in that phenomenon these days. And primary care physicians and non-psychiatrist uh, medical specialists do the bulk of prescribing, about 85% of it. So not, now... Primary care physicians in particular feel like uh, it's really within their wheelhouse to conceive conceive of uh, uh, psychological problems in medical ways within their purview to treat. And so they'll get uh, the uh, prescription pad rather than make a a referral to a psychotherapist. Mm. Right. Because I always heard and believed that medication for mental health issues was to be taken in tandem with talk therapy. But after reading your book, it seems many attitudes among practitioners even about that has changed. 
Yeah, only about that's only the case for about twenty percent of people. Mm-hmm. The, the vast majority of people will take me- me- medication alone. And so, what about um, what? Well, let me ask you this: What does good talk therapy look like from your perspective? Uh-huh. I knew you would ask that question at some point. <laughs> good talk therapy, and this isn't just my, you know. Uh, uh, um, you know my opinion. Uh, g- good talk therapy, re- really, and this is what this is what people want when you survey them. They really, a- and what the research, the bulk of the research buttresses. Good talk therapy involves good listening. Mm-hmm. It, it, you know, it, it, at one level, as basic as that, like following along with the client, taking their lead, allowing them, as human beings are apt to do, to tell their distressing life story in, in a kind of a jumbled, scattershot way uh, to, to re- really, getting back to Freud, listen with evenly hovering attention, not like prompting and cueing the client and shunting them into a discussion about symptoms, but, re- you know, and the reduction of symptoms and things they can do to reduce their symptoms, but to really let them truly open up in honest ways and really unpack their life story and unburden themselves emotionally. Mm. And that takes time. And you're not anti-drug, Enrico. Not at all. I mean... Talk therapy is just more effective, you say. Yes. Mm. In most cases, and with intractable, pernicious psychological problems, I think, in combination with medication... It's Ophira Eisenberg, host of Ask Me Another. We headed out to L.A. for two all-celebrity contestant shows, and the competition was more intense than the traffic on the 405. Linda Cardellini, Jeff Garland, Lance Reddick, and Paul Rust. Only one took home an Ask Me Another Rubik's Cube. Find Ask Me Another on the NPR One app and wherever you listen to podcasts. This is On Point. I'm Jane Clayson. We're talking this hour about mental health and the current state of traditional talk therapy. And you can join the conversation. What kind of therapy has worked for you? What hasn't worked? Have you tried it all? Let us know your thoughts. Follow us on Twitter and find us on Facebook at On Point Radio. With me this hour, Enrico Nalotti. He's a clinical psychologist and author of the new book, Saving Talk Therapy, How Insurers, Big Pharma, and Slanted Science Are Ruining Good Mental Health. I have got a board of calls, so let me get um, one in here. First, Michael in Miami is on the line. Hi, Michael. Welcome to the show. Hi. I, uh, I have a couple of comments. First of all, I think the problem with mental health in general is uh, the same as the problem with uh, health care in general, which is to say that uh, it's become entirely mechanistic, meaning that uh, there's either, either a surgery fix or a biochemical fix, uh, and it satisfies the desire of patients to sort of hand off their health care to someone else so that they don't have to do the hard work themselves, whether that be changing their diet, getting exercise in the case of physical health care, or uh, changing their thinking and changing their their behaviors uh, in order to better their, their mental health care. Mm-hmm. Uh, and th- that's where I disagree with uh, the author as well, is uh, on the benefits of behavioral therapy. I've had uh, both talk therapy for a couple of years, and that was a good jumping off point, but at some point it sort of plateaued. And um, I think that behavioral therapy uh, or cognitive behavioral therapy, at, at least what I think of as cognitive behavioral therapy, um, suggests some things that the client can do to immediately impact their life by changing certain behaviors and certain patterns of thinking. And so it's worked for you, Michael? Useful. It has it worked mm-hmm. incredibly well, mm-hmm. and um, you know it's. I I think the it's it's sort of a halfway point between drugs, which is the the super easy button, and uh, and the very long. Uh, less results-oriented mm-hmm. talk therapy. Got it. Michael, thank you. Uh, so, Enrico, s- speak to Michael's point and give us some examples specifically of where CBT might fail someone from your perspective for a traditional humanistic-based uh, talk therapy, you know, from 
what you think might be a better choice or even more effective? I mean, these approaches are not mutually exclusive, and and I, uh, uh, you know, commend the the caller for for going on his journey and and pursuing types of therapy that that benefit him. And ultimately, I think every person has to make subject, subjective judgments about like what works for them and what doesn't. I think part of the problem is in our training as mental health professionals, as psychotherapists, we. We, we, we are kind of forced into different camps. It's either kind of a non-directive therapy where you're mostly listening, letting the client open up. It's a sort of exploratory therapy versus a more directive therapy, which I think CBT is like, where it's more agenda-driven. There's goals, setting of goals, uh, tracking mood, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. I think in... In our training, we get failed to kind of really have a foot in both camps. And in my book, you know, in Saving Talk Therapy, I really kind of address these issues and the need to train therapists to to mostly be receptive listeners, but also be Mm quasi-coaches and Mm -hmm. really, uh, really really be more actively involved in being an advocate for clients' better selves. You know, we, we, in America, we, uh, with our ideas on rugged individualism, we assume that people should be their own coach, their own, you know, that they should be self-motivated, self-determined, and so on and so forth. Not so. We, we are fragile creatures as human beings, and we, we need therapists who, who can also, in addition to be good listeners, be be mentors, be be coaches, be you know s- serve that function at times in terms of nudging clients in the right direction, making the right life choices, living life more intentionally. Mm-hmm. Let me bring another voice into the conversation. Uh, Stefan Hoffman, he's a professor of psychology at Boston University, the director of the social anxiety program at BU's Center for Anxiety and Related Disorders, also has his own private practice. He's the past president of the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies and the International Association for Cognitive Psychotherapy. Stefan Hoffman, great to have you with me in the studio. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. So... What what do you make of of what you hear specifically about uh, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy? Yeah, I'm afraid uh, Enrico really um, uh, presents a caricature of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, it's this is not the way we conduct therapy. In fact, CBT um, involves humanistic uh, approaches. It is very much based on warmth, genuineness, and uh, and seeing the problem from the client's perspective. It is at the same time a structured uh, treatment that is time-limited, that um, focuses on problems in the here and now, that does not go back to the past, trying to figure out why exactly something happened in childhood. Childhood wounds. For Mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. It is also not overly helpful to simply have people, have patients talk uh, at absurdum about their own problems and getting uh, uh, more and more into their misery. Uh, CBT is problem focused, future oriented, and uh, and uh, uh, getting people in a problem solving mode. So critics of CBT and what I hear Enrico saying is that CBT follows a formula uh, that doesn't work for everyone. That therapy uh, can't be boxed into you know these quick fix formulaic approaches. That there are too many variables and circumstances and situations that mandate more flexibility and a tailored approach and a relationship that needs to be extended. Uh, beyond what CBT offers. It is absolutely incorrect. This is not the way CBT is done. Uh, this is probably, uh, a, he should read up on the literature. This was maybe uh, true in the 70s and 80s. Uh, CBT is now an, an umbrella term that involves, that includes uh, numerous empirically supported treatments. Uh, that Some of them um, are long-term oriented, uh, others much more focused, uh, uh, much more problem-oriented, some even addressing policy personality issues, uh, maybe bo- uh, 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 emotion regulation uh, uh, dysfunctions and so forth. Uh, the way it was portrayed is is clearly incorrect. Well, let me ask you this. Is there still a place at the table for talk therapy? CBT is in, is 
talk therapy. We are also talking. We are also uh, reflecting and and going into emotional uh, issues, etc. Uh, uh, CBT is at the same time. Uh, also includes behavioral and and problem focused approaches. Enrico, uh, your response? Well, well, uh, well, obviously we completely disagree. We we we're, we're both uh, there's what there are aisles that we're both on. Um, really, I mean, if you if you look at most of the research that's being done in cognitive behavioral therapy these days, it re- really. We're talking about short-term models of care, not uncommonly. The research is done on 12 sessions uh, or thereabouts. It's agenda-driven, manual-driven. These types of therapy, I I agree with Seth in in that the more sophisticated cognitive behavioral therapists are practicing in the way that he uh, mentioned, but this is not in the training of the new generation of therapists and the average a graduate program around the country. It's it's a, a much more. Uh, 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 there, there's not the training and relationship building skills that that needs to occur. Read mm-hmm. read my book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That would that that whereby cognitive behavioral techniques could be rolled into mm-hmm. uh, a skilled a skilled. Uh, a type of uh, and skillful ty- type of therapy. Is that true? So uh, I guess we're just going to have to respectfully no, disagree. Uh, yeah, or maybe even less respectful disagree. So, oh dear, so uh, not here, please, not here. So uh, CBT. Uh, no, if you go around and ask practitioners, uh, what do you do? Uh, and m- many people will say, oh well, I also know CBT. Uh, quite simply because they will. Uh, they will maybe say they so they are they are whatever also insight oriented and eclectic and also can and they all obviously can also do CBT. The the uh, matter of fact, however, is that uh, uh, this is uh, far from true. Uh, most uh, practitioners do really not know how to adequately deliver CBT, uh, even though it's a it's a sort of a you know it's a convenient um, uh, answer to, in order to get reimbursed by insurance companies and the like. So special training necessary. CBT requires saying. special training, I absolutely. See. So, Enrico, Enrico, no matter whether it's CBT or DBT or whatever form of therapy you're getting or you should be getting, I, I think the broader question for a lot of people is – that good mental health care is hard to find, and many providers are not available on mm. insurance plans. You have to pay cash if mm-hmm. you can get an appointment in the first place. I mean, talk to us about looking at mental health care from a broader perspective. Um, this notion that you should pick yourself up by your bootstraps and figure it out on your own, um, mm. you know, needs to be reconsidered, I would say. Well, I mean, I there's... I mean, I, we haven't mentioned yet the, the horrible dr- uh, dropout crisis that we have right now. I mean, and, and I, I can kind of speak to wh- why I think that is. But, you know, about 38% of people will drop out of therapy within one or two sessions. Research shows that there's the absolute minimum number of sessions that someone needs to just achieve basic uh, positive changes, about 20 about 16% of people receive that. The type of research that I look at in my book really shows that for a therapy, there's a positive dose response curve, that for therapy mm-hmm. to be effective, we're talking at least about one or two years of that, mm-hmm. and less than 9% of people kind of, kind of get that. And one, one of the reasons why is that, that clients often drop out because there's cost shifting going on, uh, too much of the time they're having to pay out of pocket uh, for services. And one of the reasons why that's true is because of the reimbursement rates. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. The average reimbursement rate right mm-hmm. now for, for a psychotherapist is about what uh, th- what was charged in the 80s. Mm-hmm. So your experience, your more experienced therapists shy away from being on panels your lesser experienced therapists, there's a revolving door of them coming in and out of panels, clients uh, uh, then, uh, in order to kind of get the kind of therapy that they desire, end up having to pay out of pocket and mm-hmm. because they're unfairly burdened financially. Mm-hmm. And that way, they, don't, they, they will get less, they will deny themselves the therapy they need. Right. So, Stefan, are different diseases served by one kind of therapy versus another? 
Yeah, so it's again a CBT is an umbrella term that involves uh, that includes a number of empirically supported interventions. And uh, you, uh, Jane, you mentioned an uh, uh, accessibility and uh, uh, of uh, of CBT in the in the um, uh, psychiatric community. It's a, uh, we want to go uh, um, for a second. Might want to look um, uh, uh, outside of the U.S. There is a, um, a, a currently uh, an, a big dissemination effort going on in the U.K. Uh, that is called uh, improving access to psychological therapies. Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, the starting out point was that um, looking at, as you know, it's a socialized uh, uh, medical system, uh, and the starting out point was that the um, that providing adequate care to patients is considerably more cost effective, reducing significantly. Uh, the overall amount of money spent on medical care than not providing people with adequate care because they will uh, the indirect costs simply uh, uh, are greater than the direct cost. So the uh, uh, Lord Laird, um, um, after um, is, is a brilliant economist, uh, and David Clark, a CBT focused uh, therapist, got together and uh, started this large dissemination effort, rollout effort, showing that it clearly can reduce overall the burden of mental health to the individual, but also enormous financial uh, cost savings to the mm. uh, entire mm. uh, country. I got to get more listeners in here. Let's go to Eileen in uh, Heatsville, Virginia. Hi, Eileen. I'm glad you waited. Welcome to the program. Uh, thank you for taking my call. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have more of a comment than a question. Okay. Um, I needed dental work, so I went to my local clinic. And in order to qualify, you had to get a physical first. And being recently widowed, um, I started crying during my examination and. Um, the first thing they said was, uh, we can give you some antidepressants if you want. They didn't even offer, you know, an alternative until I declined medication. And um, they had an in-house counselor, so I started talking to him for a while. It, it worked for me in that he eventually said something to the effect of, it sounds like you need more to unload than, you know, be analyzed. Mm-hmm. Um I and so you didn't take the medication, Eileen? I, I did not. Mm-hmm. Uh, it seemed to me that uh, maybe doctors are in a hurry to offer uh, medicine before analysis mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, I've had a family member who's in long-term counseling for PTSD and another mm-hmm. one who mm-hmm. was medicated and wound up in the hospital for two weeks because of a chemical imbalance from too many medicines. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but, uh, I hear you, and I appreciate your call, and I'm glad it worked out for you, Eileen. Thank you very much. Uh, let's get Angela in here from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Hi, Angela. Welcome to you. Yeah, um, I I think this book is great because um, I've tried both forms of therapy. I've been in um, I've been seeing a psychoanalyst for a year, mm-hmm. and. Um, I think it's the only thing that works. I uh, have you also I, tried medication, Angela? Has has that been effective? Um, I take I have PTSD, mm-hmm. and I take uh, Clonopin in the one in the evening, mm-hmm. very light dose to keep away the nightmares. But the support of talk therapy is is what I hear you say is is effective, Angela. Thank you so much, Enrico. I mean, speak a little bit to what Angela and the in the prior caller uh, were discussing. I mean, a lot of medication being pushed out there on patients. Um, as I said, you're not opposed to medication, but sometimes there may be a better approach. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, uh, along with what Angela was saying, there's actually a great research study out of London called the Tavistock Adult Depression Study that sh- is the first of its kind that shows – that with a protracted depression, uh, those clients who were given about uh, 18 months of weekly in-depth therapy, uh, at the two-year follow-up, 44% of them no longer uh, met the criteria for that, mm-hmm. compared to 10% of those who got treatment as usual, and that was essentially drugs and short-term CBT therapy. Mm-hmm. So the research is out there to to really align with what uh, Angela is saying.
never get to Friday, look back on the week and say to yourself, what just happened? I'm Sam Sanders. Check out my podcast, It's Been a Minute, where every Friday we catch up on the news and the culture of the week and try to make sense of it all. Listen on the NPR One app or wherever you get your podcast. This is On Point. I'm Jane Clayson. We're discussing mental health, traditional talk therapy, and its future. And you can join the conversation. How do we get people the proper help they need? Follow us on Twitter and find us on Facebook at On Point Radio. Here's a clip from the 2014 film Wild. In the midst of confronting the death of her mother and her crumbling marriage, character Cheryl Strayed, played by Reese Witherspoon, gives uh, talk therapy a try at a local high school. There's something else to say about it. I thought there'd be couches and Kleenex. That's 50 bucks an hour therapy. This is 10 bucks an hour therapy. So why do you think you were destroyed by your mother's death? Is that your job? To tell the bereaved that they're grieving too much? People grieve in all sorts of different ways. I'm asking you about yours. Is mine so bad? You're using heroin and you're having sex with anyone who asks. I'm not sure that these things are making you happy. Well, that's where you're wrong, because when I'm doing them, I feel good and happy. And when I'm not, I feel like I want to die. I'm joined this hour. Uh, two great guests, Enrico Nalotti, clinical psychologist and author of the new book, Saving Talk Therapy. Also with me, Stefan Hoffman, professor of psychology and director of the Social Anxiety Program at Boston University's Center for Anxiety and Related Disorders. Let me get more calls in here. Um, Jeb in Boston, you're on the air. Welcome to the program. Hi, Jane. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a, a really important conversation, I think. I'm a psychotherapist, a psychoanalyst in the Boston area, and probably one of, I feel like, half a dozen who are under the age of 50. And, uh, you know, I train for a decade very intensively to do the work I do, which is largely with people in a lot of trouble. And the conversation when I was younger in training used to be that there were all kinds of modalities out there, and they mm-hmm. were good for certain problems and not so good for others, and there was a variety. And one metaphor, and, and I will say this is not a, a perfect metaphor, but one metaphor might be that cognitive behavioral therapy, one of the things that spurred the growth of it, as I understand it, was it was easier to train people to do, and in some ways easier to administer in a short period of time. And This is a bit of a crude analogy, but you could say it was more uh, therapy on a mass production basis, kind of like that clip you just played. Do you think it works? Uh, Do you think it works, Jeb? You're a psychotherapist? Well, well, it it, it can work for certain things, but I think what gets lost in all of these um, kind of tribal or really kind of branding fights, because I really think that's the problem. I think that academia and, and the private practice market is in a kind of a branding war. And what gets lost is certain modalities are better for certain things. Now, the the real problem, I think, though, is that younger therapists have been sold too well the idea that, frankly, therapy isn't that valuable. It doesn't take that much training, but it also doesn't isn't worth that much. The, the average therapist in Boston uh, gets paid less than a private practice masseuse would by insurance companies. And so just to your guest point, the, the more trained professionals go out of network, uh, and and people kind of get ensconced into their their camps, mm-hmm. uh, but I, but I think part part but but so I, I think what what we're faced with is is actually the devaluing of psychotherapy ultimately because uh, you know I think I see people who are in a lot of trouble and it takes a lot of training to deal with pe- people with serious personality mm-hmm. issues and crises people who are suicidal etc. I got it, uh, Jeb. Thank you, Stefan Hoffman. Jump in here. I mean, Jeb says you got a branding problem with CBT. Yes, I think we do. Uh, we do have a branding problem, and I think it's not the the fault of CBT. It's it's the it's actually books like that <laughs> that seems to uh, uh, support this branding problem. Unfortunately, I would like to jump the, in uh, at some point uh, there, Jen. Uh, yes, you, the, you can. The, Hold on quickly. Go okay. ahead, Stefan. Uh, the the issue issue is we really need to uh, keep uh, human suffering uh, as our main uh, focus. It is not. It is. It, it cannot serve us well uh, delivering or or training people in therapies just because they they are fun, because we like to do them, because they they sort sort of get a get, get therapists and, and and kick. But we need to focus on the human suffering and how to improve the lives. And, uh, uh, reduce uh, suffering and improve happiness. Isn't that isn't that the point, Enrico? Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely, but I think we have we're 
you know, at a tangent in terms of just h- how to address that. I think what Stefan really underestimates, and to the point of the uh, of Jeb, there is a complete lack of diversity right now in the training and education of the average psychotherapist. There, about eighty percent of 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 faculty and clinical traditional clinical psychology programs around the country identify as CBT. There is a lack of diversity. Uh, there, it's CBT that's a one is seen as a one size fits all therapy. It is a real problem. Certain clients benefit from CBT, mm-hmm. others don't, mm-hmm. and we really need to preserve diversity in the field right now. If I could just and, jump into yeah, CBT, Stephen. CBT is not one protocol. CBT is an umbrella term for empirically supported interventions, uh, and there is a large range of different. Uh, approaches, including acceptance and commitment therapy, mindfulness-based approaches, uh, dialectic behavior therapy, behavioral activation therapy, et cetera, et cetera. This is not, there's not CBT 12-session let, protocol. Let, let me give it. you one little data point, Jane. Okay. I mean, ahead, it has been shown in the literature that empathy is about nine times like a, more predictive of, of positive change in clients than any techniques. Nonsense. I, I, I have, uh, I, I ask you this question, Stefan. Are you aware of even one course in a graduate program around the country on how to, how to perfect and finesse your ability as a therapist to be empathic? Empathy is an important part of CBT training. Uh, uh, the uh, CBT rating scale, Beck's rating scale as an example, has, has empathy as, a, as, as one of the very important points in it, as well as looking things from a, uh, seeing things from another There's a difference view, between so. kind of showing empathy as a as sort of a technique that gets rolled into a treatment than something called sustained empathy, mm-hmm. session in, session out. Uh, showing clients to really create the conditions necessary if this kind for them of to address with the real source of their problems, if, which if your treatment for many people are repressed treat- traumas, thwarted grief, you know, mm-hmm. uh, dormant mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. longings and aspirations that have been frozen over. Yeah. These are what cli- most clients want out of therapy yeah. that they're not getting. And Rico, if I could just say, and Rico, one more point, and then I'm going to go to the calls. Promoting. Go ahead. Enrico, there's a reason why your approach is not as dominant uh, in CBTS. There's a reason. Let's get Michael no, uh, in my, here. My i got to go to a call. Okay. Michael okay. in Garland, Maine. Michael, you're on the air. Welcome to On Point. Uh, hi. Hello, Jane. Hi. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Good. Okay. So, uh, gee, a lot of words. One of the words that, well, first a point and then my question. Okay. Uh, I think you've you've said that uh, the, the author has mentioned that effective talk therapy can take a couple years. Mm-hmm. So we're talking about a treatment that uh, might run thirty to fifty thousand mm-hmm. dollars mm-hmm. if you're paying for it yourself. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anyway, uh, I'd like to put the public back in public radio here by by saying I just heard the word empathy. And that empathy is an important part of the training. So I suppose it's an important part of being efficacious in whatever treatment and however eclectic your modalities are. Have you experienced talk therapy, Michael? So, Do you, have you uh, experienced so it? I'm a, I'm a, I, I'm, I'm a, I was a, my professional career was as a counselor. Mm -hmm. I focused on financial issues, Mm -hmm. but I found I always had to be a good listener. And empathy was a very important part of getting anything done. At the heart of it. Michael, uh, thank you. I'm going to move on because we have a lot of calls, but I do appreciate yours. And and thank you for your perspective. Uh, Let me get David in here from Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. Hi, David. You're on the air. Hi, Jane. Um, so I'm in a treatment for substance abuse and addiction. Mm-hmm. And so I've been to a addiction therapist before, went there for about six months, and it didn't really work for me. And what I found was the counselors I have now, they don't have degrees in psychotherapy or psychology. What they do have is ex- they were in my shoes years ago. They, are at, they were former addicts themselves. And so for me, we were talking about empathy. 
And for them, it's like they know exactly where I've been. They understand me regardless of the degree. And so I'd really agree with the whole empathy thing. Mm -hmm. David, thank you. Uh, And and good luck to you. Uh, Let's get Amanda in here from Hendersonville, Tennessee. Hi, Amanda. You're on the air. Hi, Jane. Hi. Um, So I've had talk therapy uh, for like a decade. Mm -hmm. But I think part of the problem is how we approach mental health as a whole. Mm -hmm. the medical model of disability versus the social model of disability, that the problem is that we all need to be treated with medicine and all this other stuff versus society accommodating us and destigmatizing mental illness and kind of incorporating us as a normal part of life rather than something to be set aside. I appreciate that point very much, Amanda, and I think you're exactly right. Enrico, I mean, I think we should stop talking about it as mental health and start talking about it as brain health. Hmm. Or or mental wellness, Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amanda, thank you very much for the call. Let's get uh, Laura in here uh, from Ohio. Laura, you're on the air. Hi. um, Hi, Jane. I'm glad to hear you on the show today. Thank you. Um, I'm having a bit of a... I'm, I'm glad... Uh, thank you, recent callers. <laughs> thank you, Michael, for bringing up money. How did we get to this point in the show without talking about um, maybe the... Uh, Enrico can enlighten us as to the, the details, but it's my understanding that Medicare and Medicaid in the 80s, maybe, or the 90s, stopped paying it all for people with PhDs in psychology to give traditional talk therapy and began only paying for, quote-unquote, talk therapy, regardless of the modality. Mm. Laura, thank you. I'm going to let Enrico answer because our time is short. Thanks for the call, Laura. Medicare does, you know, reimburse psychologists and a variety of other mental health professionals. The problem is, is that the, there's been about a 30% decrease in the reimbursement rate over the past, you know, 10 plus years. Um, you know, the, the Congressional Budget Office last year uh, came out with some data showing that health insurers, uh, it's not uncommon for them to cover certain medical services at about twice the baseline uh, Medicare rates. Uh, but yet psychotherapy is, is is covered by health insurers at or below the Medicare re- reimbursement rate. So, you know, with all the focus on parity laws and the need to treat medical and mental health problems equally, it's not really happening uh, across the country. Uh, psychotherapy is really un- underfunded at the federal level and also in the private sector. So to Laura's point then, how do we get people the help that they need, those who can't afford it, uh, those who can't find the therapy that, that, they might, uh, that they might need? I mean, what's the process here, Enrico? I mean, I think uh, uh, the main thing that needs to happen is that health insurers need to raise reimbursement rates for psychotherapists. It's been, you know, if you look at the medical cost offset research, uh, psychotherapy, if it's made readily available and easily accessible, actually lowers uh, uh, um, expenditures overall. Maybe there's some research that shows about for every dollar spent, $4 is saved in uh, uh, avoidable medical procedures and lost productivity. Mm -hmm. So I think the federal government, health insurers really need to get in the business of just uh, funding mental health more, funding... um, uh, uh, raising reimbursement rates. And we have an opportunity for that right now because a lot of the big blockbuster drugs uh, like Prozac, Abilify, Seroquel, are now, uh, uh, their patents are expiring or have expired. And so a lot of that money that going towards mental health that went to p- uh, pay for those highly expensive mm-hmm, drugs, mm-hmm. there are no blockbuster drugs in the pipeline. We have an opportunity to seize upon to start really focusing on psychotherapy, the funding of psychotherapy. Yeah. 
Well, I was going to say beyond talk therapy and even beyond CBT and, and medication, what about other treatments? I mean, to Laura's point about costs, what about other treatments that are less expensive? Uh, you know, nutritional um, mm-hmm. regimens, body-oriented, you know, therapies, uh, spiritual metaphysical approaches. I mean, a lot of that is out there and, and, and a lot of it does work. Not always, but it can. So I'm, uh, uh, I'm a pragmatist. I believe that to get through life... Uh, we need to try this, that, the next thing, and people need to be informed and uh, uh, not not just read the research, but uh, but all, uh, be aware of the research, but also make subjective judgments about mm-hmm. what works for them. Mm-hmm. Stefan, what would you say? Yeah, yeah, just have uh, a couple of comments. So, number one, I actually I happen to agree with that. Uh, mm-hmm. We uh, is a, an issue of destigmatizing mental health, uh, uh, psychiatric health uh, disorders, and um, and making it available and accessible, treatments available and accessible, even more easily. Now, obviously, long term therapy that where people stay in for years and years at a time is not cost effective at all. It's actually quite expensive. Uh, and so this is uh, obviously defeating the point. Uh, you, you raised the issue of, of alternative medicine approaches. Absolutely. We're looking at that uh, very issue. We were comparing yoga uh, for generalized anxiety disorder versus cognitive behavior therapy. It's an ongoing trial. Uh, we're in the last uh, stage of that. So those kind of things are being done. NIH is funding that. So our last point, Enrico, uh, in our last 30 seconds, how would you best match someone with a therapist that they need? Oh, goodness. I mean, I think you th- it really is about fit. It really is, and, and this might seem odd to say, but you can no more find – it's like finding a good lover. You, you can't just say, oh, you know, p- p- take out the yellow pages, although the yellow pages doesn't exist anymore, point to a name and call. You, you need to keep trying until you find the right person, and that, that is a sort of a subjective process at the end of the day. Well, thank you very much uh, to both of you for an important uh, conversation at times uh, lively. Uh, We appreciate that, and and thank you for being here. Stefan Hoffman, professor of psychology at Boston University. He directs the Social Anxiety Program at BU Center for Anxiety and Related Disorders. Stefan, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And Enrico Nalati, clinical psychologist, author of Saving Talk Therapy. Thank you for your time today, Enrico. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jan. Thank you. You can continue the conversation. Listeners get the On Point podcast at our website, onpointradio.org. Follow us on Twitter. Find us on Facebook at On Point Radio. I'm Jane Clayson. This is On Point. On Point.